Okay, this is the first part of lecture two on algebraic geometry in which we'll be discussing affine space and the Zariski topology on it. So first of all, what is affine space? Um, well, if you take uh, any field, um, common choices would be the real numbers or the complex numbers or a finite field. Um, so we take a field K, an affine space is then just K to the N, a vector space of N dimensions over K, except it isn't quite, as we'll see in a moment, and it's often denoted by A to the N for affine space. So what's the difference between affine space and vector space? Well, the difference is quite subtle. Um, they have slightly different automorphism groups. So let's first look at the automorphism group of a vector space k to the n. So we have automorphisms of a vector space. Well, these are just invertible linear transformations. The group of automorphisms is denoted by the general linear group over K, which is just N by N matrices of determinant non-zero. So we can picture this, if N is two, as little two by two matrices of non-zero determinant. On the other hand, if you look at affine space, a to the n, then the automorphisms include all linear transformations g, l, n of k, but they also include translations where you map any point x to x plus v for some fixed vector v. So these are the translations. So the full group, um, so this group has dimension n squared and this group has dimension n. So the full group of symmetries of affine space has dimension n times n plus 1. And it can be pictured as the group of matrices of the following shape. Where um, this bit here in the top left corner are just the automorphisms of the corresponding vector space and this bit here corresponds to translations. So um, the difference is roughly speaking that a vector space has an origin and an affine space is kind of like a vector space except you've forgotten what the origin is. Um, in other words if you've got a vector space then from any vector space, we get an affine space. And we get the affine space just by forgetting which point zero is, roughly speaking. And to get from an affine space back to a vector space, all you have to do is choose any point of the affine space as your origin. Um, and that makes it into um, a vector space. For example, um, take the three-dimensional space we live in and pretend we're in the days before Einstein, so it's not curved or anything like that. Um, then the th three-dimensional space we live in is really an affine space, not a vector space, because there's no really natural way to choose the origin. But if you choose the origin, for instance, you might choose the origin to be the center of the earth, or if you're in the um, ancient astronomer, you might choose it to be the center of the sun if you're um, trying to study the solar system, or you might choose it to be the center of the galaxy or whatever. You can choose any point you like as the, as, as, as the center of coordinates, and then three-dimensional space becomes a perfectly good vector space. But there's no canonical way to choose the identity. So we're actually living in a, well, I guess it's not really an affine space because it's got a metric, but never mind. Um, So um, affine geometry 
can be thought of as a study of the properties of affine space that are invariant under affine symmetry. So any property that is invariant under translations and linear transformations. So let's list some properties of affine geometry. Well, perfectly good concepts of things like points or lines or um, parallel lines. Because if two lines are parallel and you do any sort of linear transformation or translation, they remain parallel, so that's fine. Conics are also well defined and even polynomials. So polynomial functions on affine space. Um, ne next, we should list some things that are not affine geometry. So um, first of all, circles are not affine. And this is because if you take a circle and apply some linear transformation to it, there's no reason why the result should be a circle. It might end up as some sort of ellipse. Um, however, if you take all conics, including ellipses and circles, then that is a perfectly well-defined concept in affine geometry. Similarly, angles make no sense. Um, for example, if you take a rectangle and apply some linear transformation form 1101 to it, a skew transformation, it becomes some sort of parallelogram, and this angle here doesn't get preserved. Um, similarly, lengths um, are not well defined in affine geometry because they're changed by linear transformations. Um, uh, algebraic geometry tends to use the coordinate ring of affine space. So the coordinate ring is just the space of all polynomial functions or all polynomials on a to the n. And notice that whether or not something is a polynomial doesn't depend on the choice of origin, so that's okay. I should mention here we're taking our field k to have an infinite number of elements because if it's only got a finite number you've got to be a little bit more careful about how you define the polynomial ring. So we take the polynomial ring kx1 up to xn, all polynomials in the n coordinates. So a point here is going to be x1, x2 up to xn. Um, so if we've got affine space, we can reconstruct the ring of polynomials on it, just as polynomial functions. Conversely, if we've got, um, if we're given the polynomial ring over K, we can reconstruct affine space as the um, A to the N, as the set of homomorphisms from this polynomial ring to, um, uh, to the field K. This is homomorphisms as a K algebra. Um, so a homomorphism taking K X1 up to Xn to K uh, just takes X1 to A1 for some number, A1, X2 to A2 and so on. And so it's uniquely determined by these numbers a. So this corresponds to the point a1, a2, up to a n of a to the n. And you notice this, this map here um, is just the value of the polynomial at the point a1, a2, up to a n. So we can go from affine space to um, the, the coordinate ring by taking all polynomials. And we can go from the um, um, polynomial ring to affine space just by taking various homomorphisms.
Um, so, um, because of this, um, the study of affine space is more or less equivalent to the study of this polynomial ring. Um, so anything you can do for a polynomial ring has an analog for affine space, and anything you can do for affine space has an analog for polynomial rings. In particular, for example, the automorphism groups of these two things are the same. So um, we had auto the affine group acts on affine space, and you can also easily check that it's the um, group of automorphisms of the polynomial ring over K. Um, next, we're going to discuss the Zariski topology on um, affine space. So if we do this, we define algebraic sets So an algebraic set is a set of zeros of some set of polynomials. Um, in K X1 up to Xn. So this, this is going to be an algebraic set in n-dimensional affine space. For example, Um, we could take um, our polynomial f to be the polynomial x squared plus y squared minus 1, and then our algebraic set would just be a circle. Or we could take a set of two polynomials, f equals x minus a and g equals y minus b, the set of common zeros of x minus a y minus b is obviously just the point a b so a single point a b is also just an algebraic set and now um, algebraic sets are closed under the following two operations so they're closed under first of all they're closed under intersections This is because if we have um, algebraic sets C1, C2, C3, and so on, which are zeros of sets P1, P2, and so on of polynomials, then C1 intersection C2 intersection C3 and so on is the set of zeros of uh, P1 union, P2 union, P3, and so on. So taking intersections of algebraic sets just corresponds to the operation of taking unions of sets of polynomials. They're also closed under finite unions. And um, you've got to be a little bit careful here because if we take that the union of two algebraic sets is not given by the set of zeros of the intersection of, of their polynomials. Instead, if C1 and C2 are zeros of sets F1, F2, and so on, and G1, G2, and so on of polynomials, then C1 intersection C2 is the set of zeros of the polynomials f, i, g, j. So we have to take all products of pairs of these polynomials. And you notice this doesn't work for infinite unions, because to do for that, we'd have to take the product of an infinite number of polynomials, which doesn't really make sense. Um, now, we notice that if a collection of sets is closed under all intersections and under finite unions, then they form the closed sets for a topology. 
Um, and this is called the Zariski topology. So the algebraic sets are the closed sets of the Zariski topology. Um, of course, to check some things, the closed sets of a topology, all you have to do is to check it's closed under arbitrary intersections and finite unions. Um, arbitrary intersection means the intersection of any collection of subsets. I've sort of written as if it's a countable collection, but that's just because it's easier to write. Um, so let's see some examples of Zariski topologies. So let's first do one-dimensional affine space A1. So this is just a line. And we can ask, what are the closed sets of it? Well, first of all, the whole line is the set of zeros of, you could either take the empty polynomial or just the polynomial zero. Any finite set is going to be the zeros of a polynomial x minus a1 times x minus a2 and so on. So any finite set of points is going to be the set of zeros of some polynomial. And um, in fact, these, the, the whole of a1 and finite sets, you can easily check are the only possible closed sets. If you've got any collection of polynomials, their common zeros are either a finite set or they're the whole space. Um, in particular, this topology is a bit weird. You notice that it is not Hausdorff. And this is a bit of a problem because if you've done a course in topology, probably most of the topological spaces you have seen were Hausdorff. And your, your intuition gets used to the fact that all topological spaces are Hausdorff. And this simply isn't true in algebraic geometry. Um, for instance, if you take a line and take two points on it, if it were Hausdorff, we would have to find open sets. We, we would have to be able to find open sets containing each of these points that are disjoint. But the trouble is the only open sets contain all but a finite number of points. So any two open sets have an infinite number of points in common unless they're empty. Um, that's again assuming that we're working over a finite, over an infinite field, over a finite field that this happens to be Hausdorff, but that's a bit misleading. Now let's look at two-dimensional affine space A2. So let's write down some closed sets. Well, first of all, we've got points A, B, which as we saw earlier is the set of common zeros of um, X minus A and Y minus B. And we've also got any curve, any algebraic curve, which are the set of zeros of F, X, Y equals zero. So any irreducible curve will do. And as we said, their closed, closed sets are closed under finite unions. So a typical closed set will look like a few algebraic curves and a finite number of points. So here is a typical open, typical closed set in two-dimensional affine space. <clears throat> Notice, by the way, that the Zariski topology on A2 is definitely not the product topology on A1 times A1. So if we take the product topology on A1 times A1 and look at its closed sets, it's not very difficult to work out what these are. We get a finite number of vertical lines and a finite number of horizontal lines and a finite number of points. So the product topology on a1 times A1 is has far fewer open sets than the Zariski topology on A2. Um, so in higher dimensions, um, 
algebraic sets look like this only more so so we get points and we get one dimensional curves and we get two dimensional um, um, varieties and we get hypersurfaces and so on i just finished by giving you one slightly more exotic example of an algebraic set so this is an example of an algebraic set it's called a determinantal variety for a reason that will be pretty obvious in a moment and what we do is we take affine space of dimension m times n for m and n integers and we think of this as being linear maps from um, k to the m goes to k to the n and these obviously form a vector space of dimension m n because you can think of them as being m by n matrices and now um, an algebraic set is going to be all linear maps of um, rank less than or equal to i for some um, constant i form an algebraic set So this is going to be the determinantal variety. And we want to check that it is actually an algebraic set. So um, this is so um, um, this is given by by the vanishing of all i plus one by i plus one minus of an m by n matrix um, because this is just the condition for a linear map to have rank at most i um, so this is some set of polynomials you notice it's actually quite a large set of polynomials in general because we have to choose i plus one of the um, m rows and i plus one of the n columns and in general this would be a really quite large number of polynomials so the this this determinant of variety is given by the set of common zeros of a polynomials but it's it, it's it's a large set um, in particular for example um, the subset of maps from k to the m to k to the n that are on to is open in the Zariski topology. Um, 